Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this online session on dealing with the side effects of lung cancer and treatment organized by Lung Cancer Europe Luce. So my name is Alfonso Aguaron, and I will be moderating today's session. It is my, my pleasure uh, to introduce our two panelists today, Jackie Fenimore, Chair at Lung Cancer Nurses UK and Lung Cancer Nurses Specialty at the Christie NHS Foundation Trust, and uh, Meryl Henning, uh, Luce Ambassador, a uh, great patient advocate, but beyond that, uh, uh, lung cancer patients for uh, many years that will serve with us uh, our story and be part of the discussion today. I would like to thank you both very much for kind of to, to to be today on this session in such an interesting uh, hot topic for, for people living with the disease and the beloved ones, and also for your valuable time today, as I know the agendas are pretty packed. So um, before we get started, I would like to explain you a little bit about uh, how the webinar is going to work. So the session will last about an hour and during the first part, Jackie will provide us with a comprehensive review on this topic, which will last between 20 to 25 um, minutes. And then Meryl will, will tell us a little bit about her, about her story and how is it living uh, with the disease and also I know Meryl you've been in touch with many other patients living in a situation which might be similar so you have a lot of experience on, on this that would be great to hear and then we will have the possibility to have a dialogue with you and uh, you will have the opportunity to make questions and dialogue around these topics in case you would like to raise a question uh, there are two ways to do so so the first one is by using your microphone so to do uh, to do that, you I you have to click on the raise hand icon on the bottom bar of the of the uh, application. Um, um, they will unmute you when it is your turn, so you will be able to uh, speak to our panelists today and make your question live. If for some reason you would prefer to do that in writing, you just type your question in the Q and A or the chat uh, window, and I'll read them to Jackie and Mara. So without further ado, I'm going to share your slides, uh, Jackie. I wish you all a very fruitful and interesting session and the floor is yours. So just give me a minute. I will share your slides. So you just let me know the next one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Um, it's a great honor to be asked to do this webinar for Luce with Meryl. Um, I also want to thank Lavinia McGee, who's one of the board members who um, did some work for World Lung uh, Conference this year and lent me some of her slides, which hopefully you'll find interesting. Um, and I also want to thank all the patient advocates that took part in uh, the research that I'll be presenting on and also took part in the Q&A. Um, and also I'd like to thank LCN UK, which is Lung Cancer Nurses UK, who um, I'm on the committee for at the moment, serving as chair, and they do some fantastic work in the UK to promote um, lung cancer and making things better for patients with lung cancer. So thanks very much. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Anne-Marie Baird, who um, is the current chair of Luce, uh, had this slide and it just shows how complex in a sort of picture form, how complex lung cancer has become recently in terms of treatment options and the different diagnoses. So it's a hugely interesting time to be working in the field of lung cancer. But obviously, um, for, for patients, it, it's, it's much more confusing, I think, especially if you Google things and you want to know what treatments are available. It's become a very complex field. So there's lots of work to be done around communication and managing of side effects. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this just is a, a slide which shows um, the more complexity that there's different types of treatment. So there's lots of tablet forms of treatment. And I know my um, fellow chair today, Meryl, is, is on a tablet form of treatment, I think, although she may be able to update us on that later on in the webinar. But um, 
you know, obviously from a healthcare professional point of view, there's there's lots of interaction with people to make sure that they're on the right dose, that they're taking the treatment as prescribed and that um, we can avoid hospitalizations as much as possible and help people manage with some of the side effects as best we can. Um, and we want obviously all treatments to be targeted and effective, but some pathways are still very much um, in their infancy and we've still got a huge amount to learn in the field of lung cancer and how to best look after people on treatments. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So there's a, a huge disparity in terms of what's accessible, even just across Europe and all the countries that form Luce know that there's, there's lots of variability in terms of availability of treatment. Um, obviously, some patients are more engaged and connected um, and educated than others. So they maybe have access more to other forms of treatment that aren't available more widely. And for sicker and older patients, sometimes treatment or trial, clinical trials are out of reach because they're not able to access these other um, opportunities. And um, racial and ethnic minorities maybe don't have the same access to treatment. So that's something that uh, Luce and also there's a group called the Global Lung Cancer Coalition, which I know Meryl is also involved in, that try and make sure that access to all lung, lung cancer treatments across the globe are, are fairer. Um, there's also hidden populations. So some people, some communities maybe don't have access to healthcare. So it's really important that we try and reach out as, as a whole to communities that might not have access. Next slide, please. So it's, it's hugely important. I don't know if Meryl wants to chip in at any point while I'm talking, but just, just let me know if there's anything that you want to say, Meryl. Um, it's, it's very important for patients to be given all the information up front so that they can help decide what's best for them. Um, and lots of things come into play in terms of what their goals may be and what they want to achieve and the impact of any treatment and how they get support dealing with the diagnosis of a lung cancer psychologically some people maybe have good support from their family or healthcare professionals other people may feel more isolated so it's hugely important that we treat everybody as an individual and that we're able to support them and offer options that are appropriate next slide please do you want to say anything Meryl I can see you nodding no no but it's it's definitely true that um, every person is different. So every choice uh, a person makes is, is, can be a different choice uh, uh, based on the fact that the, 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 the goals are different in, in their life and in what they think is quality of life. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so in my role as a lung cancer nurse specialist, I work in Manchester in the north of England in the UK. We um, offer a pathway for patients with a diagnosis of inoperable lung cancer, which is a combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And because we're giving two lots of treatment together, it can cause many more side effects and be quite a difficult treatment for people to part, uh, cope with. So we did some uh, interviews with people that were just about to embark on the treatment that were halfway through the treatment and also at the end of treatment to see whether we as healthcare professionals were meeting their needs and managing the side effects and toxicities of treatment well. So I'd just like to present you a few slides on some of our findings from this study. Next slide, please. So, so what we already knew as healthcare professionals not living with lung cancer and not going through these treatments was that the treatment wasn't easy, that the pathways were very complex to try and give information to patients around what to expect and where they needed to be and how to coordinate everything for 
people in the best way, but also that we knew that the treatments would cause many toxicities and difficult side effects that people would need to be able to cope with during treatment, but also sometime after they'd finished treatment. So this could cause prolonged side effects and prolonged recovery time. And people were still living with a certain amount of uncertainty in terms of whether the treatment had worked and what their prognosis would now be. And when we were giving this to patients, we were saying that the treatment was potentially curative. So obviously people had an awful lot of pressure on them to feel that they had to do well on the treatment, even though we knew that not everybody would uh, be cured from the cancer. So I think there was a certain element of people felt that they had no choice in it and that they had to go through these treatments that would be very difficult. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what we found from the, the work that we did was that the patient experience was often different, but the information needs, there were three emerging themes that came through uh, the number one was probably the emotional impact of a diagnosis of lung cancer. But people also really needed to know how to best manage the side effects and, and the side effects of the lung cancer itself, but also the side effects of treatment so that they could get on with their lives as best as possible. But also the impact of these things, both emotionally and physically on their lifestyle and the impact of that. So next slide, please. We can explore these three emerging themes a little bit more. <clears throat> so the physical symptoms that people often had were breathlessness. Um, often they, they may have started with this symptom and that might have led to them first getting some support with their doctor. Um, they also felt very tired. That could be because the breathlessness was impacting on their ability to do things day to day. But also the treatment could cause very severe fatigue in some situations. Uh, the radiotherapy, because of the nature of where the lungs are often, was uh, affecting their esophagus. So there was some level of dysphagia or pain when swallowing. So the, often the diet had to be changed a little bit. Um, Night sweats sometimes cause people to not sleep very well. There's some level of nausea that we weren't able to manage properly because of the chemotherapy. And some people got a, a change of taste or metallic taste in the mouth. Then the emotional impact, and there's probably loads more physical symptoms. And I, I know with, with treatments that other people take, like such as Merrill, there's probably lots more physical symptoms, but these were the ones that sort of came through quite a lot in the treatments that we were giving at the time. But the emo emotional impact is probably just as severe, if not worse. And it was causing lots of anxiety, which was difficult for people to deal with and a, a feeling of feeling overwhelmed and isolated. And especially when people didn't have family nearby or carers nearby, they, they often felt very overwhelmed with the diagnosis and coping with this. So lifestyle impacts, um, the frequency of visits to hospital and the change of routine was huge. There were often long treatment waiting times in hospital, which made people feel very frustrated and that they were wasting their time. And there was lots of difficulty of having to rely on others to help. So people felt that there was a loss of independence. And also people were unsure of how they could best help themselves. So they almost needed permission to take exercise or go out and meet friends because obviously we, we sort of warn of the dangers of mixing with chemotherapy. So it, it, it's almost like people were sort of seeking what would be acceptable. So it's, it's clear that our information giving had to be a little bit more clear. Next slide, please. So as I said before, the, the main side effects people were experiencing were, were pain sometimes from the radiotherapy, which we knew would happen. So it's, it was very important to manage this more successfully. Uh, lethargy, that could be very severe from people needing to sleep for many hours during the day. 
just to get through the day or just unable to do anything or even go out for a like a stroll around the park was really quite difficult for some people. Uh, the skin reaction could be quite uncomfortable, like a sunburn from the radiotherapy. The loss of taste made food really difficult. Um, people couldn't actually enjoy a meal, so they, they were losing weight. So we had to really sort of talk about eating as a sort of medicine rather than for enjoyment, because it was so important that they didn't lose loads of weight and they kept managing to eat, even if they had to change what they were eating a little bit. The night sweats were a problem. The weight loss was obviously a physical sign and worrying for people if they felt that they weren't able to keep the weight on. And some patients do experience cachexia, which is, is severe weight loss. And then it's very difficult to turn that around and keep people from put, uh, losing weight week on week. Uh, tinnitus was probably an underplayed side effect of chemotherapy where people got ringing in their ears and that was a problem with nerve damage. So it was really important that we made sure we could limit this and, and not make that worse if people had an existing condition or certainly looked into trying to avoid it getting worse. And, and depression, anxiety and distress were underlying for lots of people that, that found it really difficult to cope with all these things happening at once. And lots of people really struggle with hair loss because of chemotherapy, which thankfully is less common now. We've got lots of new treatments, tablet treatments, but it, it could be a huge issue. And it's a very physical sign for people that somebody's got cancer. It's very difficult to hide it, even with uh, being offered a wig or uh, yeah. a scarf that, that they could. It was an obvious sign that had cancer and some people struggle with that. Do you want to chip in, Meryl? Or... Yes. <laughs> well, I, I definitely agree. I didn't lose my hair, but I, when I was first yeah. diagnosed, I thought that everyone could see that I had cancer. Uh, when I was uh, biking through the city uh, uh, or, or just walking, I thought, oh, maybe all, the, all people can see that I'm sick. And nobody saw it, but I, it felt like that. It, it, it had a huge impact on my, um, well, on, on my self-esteem at that moment, yeah. So you felt very visible, even though it may not have been as obvious yes. to other people. It's just something you felt very conscious of. Yeah, and I'm sure that's very typical. Uh, next slide, please. So what I was trying to establish is what level of information as a healthcare professional I needed to give and whether the information we were giving out was useful or not really appropriate in terms of what we needed to discuss. So it was very difficult to pitch because some people felt that we weren't giving enough information and other people felt that we were giving too much. So that just highlights to me that everybody's an individual. Some people want more information and you have to be able to provide that other people want to talk things through some people don't want to read anything in advance and so we're sort of almost saying no you must read something so that you've got an idea around what to expect but these are just a few quotes from patients that we treated so one patient said I thought it was going to be awful people living with cancer I think you're not meant to use the word patient now we discussed that <laughs> um, I thought it was going to be awful and I wouldn't be able to eat anything but it wasn't that bad but the skin burn was horrendous so this particular patient had a really severe skin burn which we perhaps didn't see that often so we didn't make a huge deal of that but that really affected that particular person uh, the side effects were toned down just a little bit too much so as healthcare professionals, we felt that we were giving loads of information, but some people felt that it wasn't enough. Uh, I don't think they prepare you for how grueling it is. So again, that's quite difficult to pitch, but I think the word grueling just emphasizes how difficult these treatments can be. Um, it wasn't that I couldn't be bothered. I just didn't want to know all these things. So some people don't want to know all the information that we're giving them. I just want to know everything. I'm one of those people. 
I think nobody wants to hear a horror story. So perhaps the side effects up front sound really difficult for people. And I don't want to be told bad things, which I think is quite a human reaction, really. Next slide, please. So the emotional impact, um, I'll just read these through just so you get an idea, but it's a tough treatment, mainly because of the mask. You can't see, hear or speak with it on. I'm not a woman, but I still don't particularly want to lose my hair. I even give it a name, Harry, and I used to talk to it. So this is a patient talking about uh, her cancer. She wasn't going to let it get the better of her. No information once you've completed treatment. So I think that's a, a typical thing for a lot of people is it's very intensive and then they finish and they don't know where to turn or there's very little support in that interim period before coming back to the hospital. Maybe an information booklet or something with general information about how to get over treatment. There's so much going on. The information tells you about the medical information, but it doesn't tell you about the psychological impact. It needs to focus more on your psych. And another person said, I've remained positive. It, I've not stopped working. So some people, as we know now, lots of young people are affected by cancer. They're very busy. They've got very busy lives and they want to actually be able to just carry on doing what they normally do. So, so it's all Next about slide, communication. Please. Jackie, it's all about <laughs> communication uh, that yes. you have um, in front, uh, how you want to be treated and how you want to be, uh, how to, how you want to be communicated with. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's very variable, I think, in terms of, especially where I work, it's a very, um, it's a very big city, but there's lots of areas where it's been more industrial in the past and more working people in terms of uh, hard industry, lots of people diagnosed with lung cancer um, that perhaps really struggle with a lot of the information that we're giving them. So some people want more information, some people want less. So it's it's just about treating everybody as an individual, isn't it? And giving them the need to know information, but also having more available if you need it. Uh, next slide, please. So lifestyle impacts. Um, it's been quite an assault on your body. It's just been tough. I'm going to bed at eight o'clock every night. Get ready for the fight of your life. It really was. So that some of these quotes really emphasize how difficult this treatment is when they're dealing with two sets of side effects. Once the fatigue sets in, it's there for the day. It's not the sort of tiredness where you say, right, I'll have a 20 minute sleep. Knowing when to start to get walking, get moving, starting to push your exercise tolerance. So lots of people really want to be given permission to do something positive for themselves and get, get out there and get on with life again. And one patient said, I had have a conscious thing because I need to be here for the children. So I carry on eating, even though many times I could have given up how I ate. I don't know. So it's that drive within to succeed with treatment and, and keep going, I think, is very, very strong. Um, I think if I keep myself fit, it might stop this tumour coming back. So certainly in the UK, there's an awful lot of emphasis now on prehabilitation and trying to incorporate a healthier lifestyle, especially when you're going through treatment. And lots of our treatments now go on for many years. They're, they're continuous until people get too many side effects or the cancer starts to become active again. So it's just this learning to live with cancer and beyond cancer is is hugely important now. Next slide, please. Uh, just another quote around how the cancer was affecting a person's ability to eat. So it was affecting their esophagus. Um, and one guy said that it had been really severe. He'd just been living on Rice Krispies or cereal for about a week. That's all he could swallow. Um, 
and the pain management team were fantastic, but they needed to be tied in much earlier. So that was uh, a, a clue to us that we perhaps needed other services to help us support patients in the best way. And it's not just about maybe pain from treatment, but it can be about psychological support or signposting people to the, the best way that they actually can support themselves. Next slide, please. So in the UK, we have um, a charity called uh, Maggie's, which was set up by a patient person living with cancer. And there are areas where people can go for support. They can just have a cup of tea, relax. It's all um, free. You know, they have activities like yoga and support groups. So they've been really hugely helpful for people living with cancer. We also have a charity called Macmillan where nurses can come and visit people in the home to help them manage side effects from treatment or just coping generally. Obviously, we have in the UK a role called a lung cancer clinical nurse specialist, of which I'm one. And we've got um, about 500 now across the UK, but it started off maybe 20 years ago. There were only about 10 of these nurses and it's really evolved and our medical colleagues find the role hugely helpful. So often every patient in the UK with lung cancer is linked in with their clinical nurse specialist and it's a point of contact where they can get information and support and be assessed to make sure that they're coping okay. Obviously family is hugely important as well just so that you've got that support and maintaining a positive attitude focusing on completing the treatment was huge for people but now we have treatments that people don't complete they're just ongoing constantly and that can have a huge impact too and the idea that there is no alternative you're faced with this diagnosis and just have to get on with doing the best and having the treatment so I don't know Meryl if, if there's anything that slide has brought up for you that you want to discuss well um maintaining the positive attitude oh you're on mute i don't, I don't. no I'm not oh, you're, on mute. no you're all right now <laughs> i can hear you well the the motivation maintaining the positive attitude i don't think you can maintain a positive attitude and you can you can you also cannot have a positive attitude if you are not positive um so uh, and, but that is something also for a psychologist, how to deal with all the negative uh, attitudes that you have. Um, if you have cancer, you failed, your body has failed you. Uh, um, a, a lot of doctors also say that the, uh, you failed the treatment but the treatment failed you. So it's all about wording. It's all about um, uh, being in the open, uh, about talking about it and to search for other uh, people uh, with the same uh, uh, disease. Yeah. So do you find that you get a lot of support from knowing other people going through what you're going through? I'm not a very um, emotional person. Um, I get a lot of, I get a, a positive attitude for helping other people uh, in their pathway. Um, well, I was diagnosed eight years ago, so um, I, I, I know a lot of, 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 of the, the, the different um, things at the, at the pathway. So I can help people um, and give them hope uh, that, well, it is possible to live longer uh, with, with a terminal disease. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you're a tremendous advocate for that. And, you know, you do so much work to really campaign and, and lobby for better better support and better treatments for people living with lung cancer across Europe. So I know you do a huge amount now also. Thank you for doing what you do. I know it can't be easy some days. Next slide, please. 
so, so there's a, a theme of, of some people feeling quite isolated as, as well so uh, one person with cancer just sort of reflected on how people cope who are on their own he didn't know he had great support from his family but he he saw in the waiting area when they were waiting for radiotherapy there were some people going through the same treatments and they were always on their own and it really was quite a poignant reflection for this particular person um one person said it's emotionally been tough it's been tough i'm very positive person normally this will not beat me it definitely won't it just won't i won't have it so that positive attitude coming through again um, and one person said Macmillan support has been really helpful a few times I rang them over a couple of things as it's been difficult um, so just having that place to reach out to is often really really key I think to help people get through these difficult situations so next slide please so so I think it's always really important to um, try and be honest and upfront and give as much information as you can and just try and work out what would suit an individual best some people prefer it verbally some people prefer written or, or they can seek their own information from the internet and how to cope with some of the side effects um, and also cope with the diagnosis um, specific information on certain treatments would be really helpful and things have changed so much in lung cancer it's really hard as a healthcare professional to keep up with all the updates and different pathways so it's always really useful to be able to seek out information from other organizations um, this particular pathway we, we were looking at who needed a mask and whether we could give more information on that up front because that proved to be quite difficult for people to cope with um, and also claiming benefits, dietary advice, exercise, so we could link people in with maybe prehab or get them uh, moving to a local gym where they offered classes for people living with cancer. And also uh, life after treatment, if they got to the end of the treatment, that was always very difficult time. So uh, looking at living with and um, beyond cancer and also survivorship issues so like Meryl said she's been on a treatment for eight years which perhaps eight years ago was impossible to conceive but now people are living really well with lung cancer even if it's a stage four diagnosis and so that throws up all sorts of issues again and it must be hugely difficult when you know that some people have had the same diagnosis and treatment as you and they haven't done so well and so there may be feelings of guilt around that I think people have touched on that before I don't know if you want to yes. talk about that Meryl yes well it's 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 it goes both ways because um, uh, normally I don't mention if I have a great scan or if, if, if everything was all right again because I know people are struggling with the same diagnosis I had and, and are not doing that well and I don't want to burden them anymore. Uh, so there's definitely guilt, but uh, well, certain points uh, at a time, uh, in November 11, uh, for instance, uh, it was eight years ago uh, I was diagnosed. That I will mention because that can pe give people hope that they can also beat the statistics, etc. And it is possible to live that long with a stage four uh, cancer disease. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's truly um, incredible, really. I think the way lung cancer is evolving and treatments are evolving and people, you know, maybe soon it will be considered a disease that's more of a chronic condition rather than uh, a terminal cancer. We just really hope that we can get to that position. But I know for certain pathways that's looking more realistic as we go on year by year but it's still a very difficult disease to say that you know there won't be very severe situations where people aren't going to do well on treatment so it's so this uncertainty I think living with that must be 
incredibly difficult from day to day. Shall we go on to the next slide, please? So, so again, lots of people want more information how to cope with things. Um, diet, obviously some side effects cause bowel disruption. So people need information on what they can eat, what they should avoid, how to mix with other people if, if they're, you know, it could just be psychologically they feel like Meryl was saying that everybody knows they've got cancer. They might not want to always talk about it or they might be meeting new people where they, they just want to be able to live their life without this being the be all and end all of everything. But um, it's very important that people feel confident to be able to mix and go out with people as well. So if they're having side effects, that might be more difficult. So it's it's all about maybe prioritizing what's important to you as an individual. And if there's something you really want to do, just making sure that you use that as your goal. And that's that's something you really want to achieve rather than maybe becoming too tired. And then the things that you really find important aren't things that you're able to participate in. So it's all very individual again. But yeah. I think the danger is people, as this person says, it's uh, the risk of sitting at home all day and not doing anything. And that can really make people become more isolated and more depressed or anxious. So it's about getting a balance, I think, and being able to do the things that are really important. Next slide, please. So um, what happens next with living with a diagnosis of lung cancer and beyond? Next slide, please. So um, my colleague and friend, Lavinia, uh, lent me this slide that she presented at World Lung Cancer Conference just in August this year. And she um, did a, a survey or, or asked uh, people living with cancer what was important to them. And this was some feedback from a patient advocate, Jill Feldman, who has been on treatment like Meryl for many years. And everybody says to her, she looks great. And she often feels far from great. She's got lots of side effects going on. And so in red, there's lots of things that she's perhaps dealing with or other patients are dealing with day to day that maybe people aren't aware of. So. Uh, anxiety and depression can affect your dent dentistry and your teeth can feel very vulnerable. Um, oral care and dry mouth. Skin rashes can be a huge problem. Shortness of breath again, you know, often people present with that and some of the treatments can make that more severe. Um, pain or numbness from uh, the treatments and if patients have had surgery, there can be uh, problems with that long term. Um, diarrhea and nausea, fatigue, as we've mentioned, some chest wall pain. So lots of things that people are dealing with may come and go. But obviously, even if they're very mild in terms of what a healthcare professional might grade as a grade one or a grade two can have a huge impact on people if they're living with these side effects from treatment for years and years. So I thought that slide was really poignant and really um, got the message across really well that even if people look well and they're dealing with the lung cancer incredibly well day to day, they're often dealing with lots of complex problems that may be mild, but add them all together and it can really have a huge impact. Especially so next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Meryl maybe wants to say something. Well, because the foggy brain and the trouble with the words retrieval and the focusing, people lose their jobs and they lose their income. And it gives mm. them also financial toxicity because they also have uh, the treatment that they need. And, and well, especially when you're in, in the United States, it comes with a lot of costs. So uh, it, it has a huge impact uh, on, on your family as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's hugely important, isn't it? I didn't read that one at the top. There's just so many. I can't see the ones at the bottom so well because I'm trying to do this on a laptop. I don't know if you can read the ones at the bottom, Meryl. But um, the, there's just a huge amount of things that people are having to deal with all the time. And although we're successful in the treatments that we're giving and keeping people alive, it it is at a price, isn't it? And it's it's how best myself as a healthcare professional and other people support people living with cancer, but also going through these treatments that there's still quite a lot of unknown longer term toxicities or issues around that we we have to learn as we go along. But you're the people going through it, it it's not always easy. We we need to learn more about this. So webinars like this are really helpful, not just for people living with cancer, but also healthcare professionals, because we get an opportunity to hear a patient voice and, and your aspect of how things are for you. So it's really great to do this with Meryl. I was in awe of Meryl when I first met her. And I think, you know, it's incredible that you're giving your time to do things like this. So thank you very much. Um, I think that's, is there another slide, Alfonso, or should we go to a, uh, yeah, it's just. That's, that was the last, the last one, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jackie, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation and review. And also thank you, Mer, for, for the additions you made. Um, before going on to, um, to the questions, I would like to remind all of our attendees that you can you have two options to, to make your question. One of them is pressing the raise hand uh, button on the bottom part of your screen, just in case you would like to make your question uh, by microphone or type your, your question in the chat. But before going on to that, Meryl, um, as I mean, you have already provided some some uh, information about your life as a patient for, for eight years now, uh, since, since the time of the diagnosis. You're gonna have your eighth birthday soon, let's say. Um, but I would like to hear from you because I know you have played, I mean, to know a little bit more about your story and also in your role as a patient advocate, I know that you have met many other people living with the disease, many other caregivers. And as Jackie very well presented, this is a disease that due to its complexity, it has an impact on your whole life, not just the physical side, the emotional, the lifestyle. Uh, also, the, the 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 life of the people who is around you with lots of emotions, social, family, economical, financial issues around that. So it would be great to hear from 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 you a little bit more and how how has been your life since the time of diagnosis. I know it it might be difficult to sum up everything, but but it would be great to hear a little bit about your your story. I, I won't sum up everything. Well, I was diagnosed in November 2014, and I was lucky to live in an area where they did molecular testing, and it was uh, also tested for ROS1, and that was even more rarer, uh, and I was uh, positive for ROS1, but the testing time took uh, uh, some time, and uh, I, I had a very progressive uh, disease, so I was put on chemotherapy because, uh, well, otherwise I would be dead uh, uh, without a proper diagnosis. So I had my chemo, and it uh, uh, the pathway, which is now very complex with all kind of treatment options. I didn't have a treatment option. It was uh, after chemo. It was a, a, a first line uh, uh, targeted treatment or no treatment. So uh, it was very easy because you you well you only had one option. Well, you had two options. No treatment is also an option. So I went from uh, a, a TKI one uh, uh, well targeted ter therapy to uh, a targeted therapy in 2016 after progression. And uh, I have no evidence of disease ever since um, with only a few side effects, which are manageable. Uh, but the, the, the uh, word retrieval, uh, the, the loss of, of 
cannot find the words uh, is, is, is one of them, uh, especially also the, the foggy brain. So I lost my job because I couldn't function anymore. Uh, and, um, and I thought, well, I am well educated, I'm engaged, I'm empowered. What can I do for the lung cancer society? And I thought, well, maybe um, I have, I can have some impact because times were changing within lung cancer field that the patient's voice is getting more and more important. Uh, so for, for a patient advocate, it's, it's a great time to be uh, active uh, nowadays. So, well, I wanted to be a part of it and I wanted to, to become a patient advocate, but also being a patient can, well, it, it has an extra value, I think. Um, for me, the, the side effects are, I'm when I present, I have to uh, write down every word I'm going to say. Uh, be, and uh, before that, I was a teacher <laughs> at, at the university and I ha just had a slide and I just talked. I cannot do that anymore because when I subtract it, then uh, suddenly I don't even know what I'm talking about. Another great uh, side effect for a lot of people on uh, targeted therapy is the weight gain. And for me, exercise is, well, it's, it's, it, for me, it's a lifestyle uh, every, well, for, for the last uh, 30 years or so. So for me, it, uh, exercising, uh, ex to exercise is so important uh, that it's awful that you feel your, your tummy or you, you feel your butt. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, well, I, I don't know how you say it, but you want to, you want to have an athletic uh, body because you exercise so much and then you suddenly, you, you, you become fat. And I know uh, one uh, uh, oncologist, and he said about my medication, well, people get fat and crazy. So, <laughs> but you can, you, it, it's, it's, um, you can manage it uh, through the years because you, you, you get to know your own body. Uh, and when you have something, uh, a pain or something, go directly to your doctor and don't wait and don't think, oh, it goes away uh, by itself. No, we are living in our spare time. So we, our quality of life should be uh, uh, on top. Uh, so if we have some stomach egg or we have some other issues with the body, seek help. Uh, and, and also if you have uh, uh, some kind of, of, of uh, anxiety or depression, there are great psychologists who can help you. Uh, um, and I know that uh, the, the, the patient pathway is a lot changed now because there are now nurses, uh, oncology nurses, there are now uh, psychologists uh, uh, right at the diagnosis. Um, but it's so important that you have a whole team, a whole medical team to, to help you. I, I just wondered um, if I can ask you, Meryl, how, how you deal with the side effects you get from the treatment you're on and if you can elaborate a little bit more around the side effects that you get or if you just sort of manage to accept them and incorporate them into your daily lifestyle. Yes, I have to accept them because there's no alternative. Um, and and uh, it, my, my doses could be lowered, but after six and a half years, I, I, I'm afraid to lower the dose of my, uh, uh, of my treatment. And uh, because it's working so well now, and, and, and then you say, well, okay, then I have to manage my side effects. And, for me, forgetfulness is very, um, uh, well, it's, it's an issue. So if I park my bike or I park my car somewhere, I take a picture 
of where I put it. <laughs> so yeah, and and so you have all kinds of of well uh, uh, things that you can that you are um, helping you uh, to manage. Yeah. So you sort of got used to coping mechanisms so that you can function day to day without too many stresses. Yes, okay. but you have, yeah. to, you have to live very structured in a structured way, uh, especially with a foggy brain. Um, and I'm not, well, I'm not that structured. So I always lose my keys, my wallet and my glasses and etc. Et hmm. It's okay, that's expected. it's really useful to know. <laughs> yeah, that's something perhaps we don't recognize as much as healthcare professionals is foggy brain. It seems to be a big deal to you. Do you would you say that's the the one that creates the biggest impact for you? Yes, and the weight okay. gain. The weight gain. But the foggy mm. brain is always there, and mm. uh, well, it makes you. Sometimes it, it's like living in a fishbowl and you are seeing people and you can connect, but sometimes you, you're, you well, underwater or something. I, I, I can't yeah. explain, but it's very, it, it's, it's very hard at times and it's very yeah. tiring as well. And, and when do you get more tired than you used to with, with that impact on you feeling... Like your brain's not functioning well, no. No, no. So you 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 don't experience tiredness at all, really. You just get on with life. Yeah, that's good. Okay. How do you? Oh, you carry on, Alfonso. Yeah, but I would like to to have like a, an open question because hearing of you, Mara, and and also what you uh, during your presentation, um, um, Jackie, you were mentioning, of course, the fact that not two patients are the same, but there are some kind of commonalities and things like that. And I think it's great what you what you just mentioned, Meryl, that with the time you learn how to develop certain types of mechanisms to deal with the, to live with the disease in a sense. But from another perspective, I would like to ask you from, from the different points of view, as this is uh, becoming a more and more complex uh, disease to deal with in the sense that right now you have longer overall survival so there are more needs in different aspects the physical the emotional the social and so on on one side I would like to ask you Meryl is there something missing out there in the system that will allow you to have a better coping with the disease because you, you, sometimes we mention about having these multidisciplinary teams or more, more a kind of holistic approach to treat that. And from your perspective, Jackie, as working on a daily basis with lung cancer patients, what are the challenges that you are facing in that sense? Because I understand that you cope a lot with side effects of treatments and so on, but there might be something of that that your patients express to yourself, like, like what you were mentioning in the inside study about something that has to do with each type of personality with its type of feelings believings and things like that that might be also an issue for you because you don't really have the 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 tools or or exactly what you need to cope with that so from both perspectives what do you think is missing out there if there's anything missing out there and what would be requested because after all we're patient advocates as well and this is something that we would like to 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 improve for for, for our community can, can I start? Because, because otherwise I forget the answer. <laughs> um, yes, some are, uh, is definitely missing and that, well, it starts with good communication. Uh, what does the patient wants to know? My mother-in-law, she had also lung cancer and she died and she didn't even want to see the scans. She didn't want to have her, she didn't want to hear her diagnosis. Uh, she didn't, because if she didn't hear it, it wasn't there. So there are so many types of people that communication is key, but you also need a whole whole, whole team of, of, of professionals helping you. Because if you are getting a diagnosis of a terminal disease, 
suddenly you think you're going to die in in the next week or so. So and and and, and it's so important that you are well not dealing with it alone. Uh, and family is there and and they want to support you, but they cannot give you the tools that you need to survive in at, at least the, the, the first uh, few months. But that's my opinion, but more a multidisciplinary team. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. And I, I think that's really uh, important because there's so many aspects to living well with cancer, isn't there? And the input that you need or the signposting you need to the right support and services and even you know like you say the financial toxicity is is huge for some people and they really need to get that support um I suppose from a healthcare professional from my point of view it's managing people's expectations is difficult and obviously expectations now have exceeded everything that we perhaps felt we could achieve initially from some of the new treatments and things you know it gives us time to maybe develop new pathways and all the information we're getting on mutations it's just trying to keep up to date and giving people the information in bite-sized pieces so that they can understand where we're going next and you know if there is other options but also being realistic about what we can achieve and supporting people. I know times of scans and results is, is hugely anxiety creating for people. So how we sort of can anticipate that and support you as best we can. Because I know sometimes our appointment system doesn't align. So people, people may have a scan a month before they're going to get the results and they're just sitting at home, which is terrible. So it's sort of so we can actually be more communicative or, or support people much more timely in terms of when we know their scan is, we book them an appointment as soon as it's reported. So there's, there's, there's a huge sort of need for a proper admin support and administrators within the hospital setting where I work that nurses end up trying to do everything and actually our nursing time is really being impacted because of all all the extra support needs so that's huge for us do you want to say something now yes yes but i lost my mouse uh well and and it's also because well uh, 15 years ago when you got lung cancer, a clinician could do it because there was chemo radiation uh, surgery and then most of the time it was death. Um, but now with all the treatment options, the role of the nurse is becoming more and more uh, important to get to have the, well, uh, the, the oncologist for the treatment, for the, the clinical and, and the nurse for everything else. Absolutely. That would be my, uh, well, optimum. Yeah, well, that's a good point to finish the webinar on. The nurses are very important these days, I think. And certainly in, in the UK, our role has expanded very much. And, and on the whole, patients really appreciate what we can do. But there's just not enough of us because people are living much longer with cancer and the comorbidities and toxicities from treatment which need a huge amount of impact put and support with so it, yeah it's a it's an ever-evolving role as a nurse specialist that's for sure so it seems we're we're basically uh, one minute left to finish uh to, to to be on time but before that uh, both yaki and Mara would like uh to have a very brief last word or take away message to to our audience based on what we have discussed uh today it would be great to 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 have a, a few words from from you both guys before closing the the session so i'm not sure who would like to go first maral jackie or shall i um some for the people with uh, uh lung cancer don't downsize 
your side effects. Don't downsize any burden you have of your treatment or, or something else. Just go to your nurse or your oncologist and uh, talk about it. Uh, uh, even if you don't have an appointment for a scan, because it's for, for them, it's very important to know what kind of side effects there are. And for you, because your quality of life is so important. And Jackie? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with what Meryl said. If you reach out for help, there is somebody there that will be able to help direct you or signpost you even if you're in a different country and there doesn't seem to be an actual person within the hospital that you can contact if that's not the case then look online and just try and get the right support that you need or the information and there's lots of internet support now on groups I think you're part of the Ros Wonders aren't you Meryl and so you know if you have a particular diagnosis then if you feel alone, just try and get that support that you need. Thank you both. So I think with these with these last messages, we will bring the session to an end. But before closing, I would like first of all, Jackie Merrill, thank you so so much for your presence and valuable time and for your insights today. I think it's been a very very interesting um, uh, session, and especially because I know you are fully packed in your agenda. This are last time of the year. It's usually even busier than, than usual. So thank you very much for making your time. I would also like to thank uh, our attendees today for, for uh, joining us on the webinar. Just to remind you that the whole uh, webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded soon to our YouTube channel. So you will be able to uh, see that again. Also to thanks all the viewers that we have on Facebook following the, uh, the stream as well. And uh, just to let you know, please stay connected to our social media uh, channels in Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, because next month, as you all know, is the Lung Cancer Awareness Month and there will be lots of activities coming on. We will be presenting uh, the second stage of our campaign, Get Check, which this year is going to be Get Diagnosed about the importance of recognizing signs and symptoms and unusual risk factors of lung cancer and get diagnosed as soon as possible. Also, we will be presenting our yearly report, so please stay tuned. And just to let you know that in December, we will have uh, our last year webinar on rehab and rehabilitation for lung cancer patients, which I think it's going to be a very interesting follow-up uh, session uh, from this one. Being said that, I would like to wish you all a very fruitful evening. Jackie, Meryl, thank you again for, for your time today. And I wish to see you very soon in our upcoming activities. So good evening to everyone and have a very, very nice uh, uh, day. Bye.